What I want to do uh, this uh, afternoon um, is uh, this is an odd display here. Uh, is um, go through go through uh, uh, three moves, I guess. Um, I want to start a little bit with motivating my personal interest in time uh, issues, which has to do with my interest in group learning and computer supported uh, group learning. Um, talk a bit about, uh, basically recap a bit of the content of the paper Barbara mentioned and also uh, <coughs> then so why event-based um, models and uh, analysis uh, methods might be, uh, um, if not better than as suitable than, than more variable-based approaches to uh, studying uh, time-dependent processes in groups. Uh, and um, uh, also in that part, give a bit of uh, one or two examples, uh, so some extent they may be familiar to you, uh, of how to practically do process processes, processes, processes of, of, of that type. And in the, in the third part, I want to sort of, uh, s uh, in good, uh, I guess, almost German tradition, want to question my own position. <laughs> and. Uh, and talk a little bit about the, what I perceive as the limits of um, uh, event-based uh, process modeling. Uh, it's always good to know about the limits because then one, of a method a methodology, uh, because no methodology is is uh, is, is applying to, uh, to to everything. It has its place and it has its limits. And I want to um, also talk a bit about the limits, having talked about the potentials uh, and perhaps written about it a, a bit more over the, the last years. Um, and time allowing, um, I'm, I'm usually chronically bad in timing presentations. Um, I'm, um, uh, I'm also prepared to uh, uh, show you a bit of an example of perhaps an application of process mining that also works in universities as, a, as part of almost standard teaching, if one would want to, so not only in a research context where one has all the time of the world to uh, uh, do coding and analysis, but also as a feedback source, perhaps for students, uh, as, an, as part of their uh, learning. Uh, and that would relate to some more recent work we have done on, um, on uh, using process mining on, um, in the context of university writing uh, classes, academic writing. Uh, but that's only time allowing if it Time does not allow the hour, and you're interested, uh, send me an email and I'll send you uh, papers or, uh, uh, or the slide sets that I have prepared for that. So, so. Uh, I guess since it's a uh, discussions for seen after, I'm, I'm fine answering questions right away if, it, if you think it's something that would help your understanding. I guess uh, discussion there's end of time, a real discussion there's end of time during the, during the afternoon. Uh, so by all means, do interrupt me if you um, if you uh, think a uh, quick quick question uh, and answer for me could remedy the the point. Um, so let me start with a uh, with a with a, a quick look at um, uh, a bit of the challenge. This in, challenge is involved in um, in looking at at groups, be they online or face to face, uh, from a, from a analysis and, and method point of view. Uh, may, may be helpful sort of to get us started to sort of think of, uh, of uh, processes and groups happening at, at multiple levels of scale, of time scale. And this uh, analysis owns very much to the, uh, to the work of, uh, of, um, of McGrath, of course, uh, I guess some of you know, uh, social psychologists who spend uh, uh, a good part of his academic life on analyzing time issues of time in groups, um, and um, uh, suggested that you know, there are at least four levels of, um, of, pro of four levels of time that um, uh, we, we can look at when we look at a group. There's a level of developmental processes, uh, group developmental processes, which tend to be uh, go on over days, weeks, and months, perhaps, depending on how group stays together. Um, uh, there are adaptation processes which may be uh, uh, on a, on a, you know, can happen uh, quite frequently uh, are triggered by uh, uh, external uh, demands on a group. There are operational processes which are triggered by the internal demands of a group and are um, have to do with uh, have to do with how a group how a group goes about its work. And then there are uh, learning processes which um, um, 
in a, in a more uh, specific sense, which uh, are um, uh, uh, particularly related to the uh, operational uh, processes. Um, uh, examples of a few, you know, good processes on, on, on development scale have been analyzed a lot uh, in social psychology, as has many other uh, work that I'll be uh, talking here initially. And so the, the, probably the most uh, famous uh, model of group development are the four stages by, by Tuckman, based on a psychoda on psychodynamic theory. Uh, so there we have the famous, uh, probably most of you have heard about forming, storming, norming, and adjourning uh, phases that groups uh, go through. And this means real groups where that potentially have to work together for uh, months, if not years, and where uh, and where the members are strongly dependent on each other in the sense that uh, one of them failing will have uh, implications for, for, for the others. Um, so that's a typical long-term development uh, model. Then there are the adaptation to change processes. Those are, in a sense, not not conscious, don't happen, on a, happen necessarily on a conscious level of the, uh, of the group, so they're not necessarily discussed. It's the kind of uh, adaptations that are often described, uh, the kind of behavior that's often described in terms of complexity theory, um, uh, where a system such as a group or an individual or any complex system sort of uh, moves in a, in, a well, in a landscape of local minima and maxima. And uh, if it's on one of the local maxima and something happens in its environment, uh, it gets perturbed and has to find a new uh, local maximum. Um, and there's the language of that, as I said, that's often done uh, sort of semi-automatically and not necessarily uh, makes it into the discourse level of the, of, of the group. Um, just one of the features of this, looking at it from a complexity view, is that in order to get to the next local maximum, you have to go through a valley usually, which is also often difficult for groups to leave a level of performance and to move to another level of performance, maybe higher performance, because usually your performance will decrease um, initially. Um, um, the, f the third level, uh, and probably one I'm most interested in, or where also the methodology I'm sort of going to talk about a bit more, fits best to, is the operational level or group as activity systems. I take took a longer quote here from McGrath because I couldn't manage to get it shorter. <laughs> uh, it describes a lot of uh, things. So just to give you an idea why, what you know what the the challenges or the kind of phenomena are that that happen on that level if a group engages as a, engages in work. Uh, so it has to do with with resource scarcities and the need for setting priorities. Uh, um, there are um, selections to be made between uh, between uh, pot potentially diverging goals and hence the need for strategic planning. Um, there needs to be operational planning uh, in order to organize um, a division of labor, and then is coordination order in order to manage the division of uh, of labor. Uh, uh, obviously, this is also the area that's uh, often researched, uh, not only in social psychology but also in in work psychology, uh, organizational psychology, and uh, organizational sciences. And on the on the on the level, and then there's the level of learning and processes occurring there. And uh, McGrath, and I think that's quite helpful, makes a distinction between learning and adaptation. So learning is a, is very much a deliberate process. Uh, it's it's sort of so to speak, of the consciousness of the group and uh, its members. Um, it's usually a reflective process. It's not, um, you know, automatically shifting and try and so trial and error. That would be typical for adaptation. Um, it's uh, also reflective in terms of time. At this stage, it's highly uh, learning at this level of a, of a, uh, in this meaning is uh, affected um, by a great many things. Amongst them, also uh, the kind of um, idea a group has about itself. For instance, does it consider itself to be a task force, a crew, uh, or a team? Uh, these kind of group forms have various time dimensions, life lifespan, so to speak, and uh, and many uh, and the form of learning is affected by by the group's interpretation of the time it has um, for its its work uh, as well as for uh, for learning. 
uh, and so why it's you know the learning at this or group pros at this level are deliberate also because they are anticipate uh, they are affected by interpretations of the group's history. So what you know what are we supposed to be and what have we done so far? Does that fit our idea if we are one of these uh, group pros, for instance? But also it, it depends on the anticipated future. Um, um, for, a, for a team, for instance, some forms of learning are more appropriate than, than for a crew, which may be, may be together only for a couple of hours to fly a plane from here to Amsterdam, as it were. <coughs> and learning will be different uh, in many ways from, from the technology management. To stay for a moment with the, with the, uh, um, <coughs> with the uh, learning theme, where there's learning, there should also be memory and, uh, and, and changes to knowledge uh, uh, and it's also indicative or interesting to sort of be, be, be articulate about the uh, various memory systems that a group has available and learning can happen in either one of those memory systems or across all of them and in various uh, divisions so this uh, is mainly sort of to, to, to sort of tell us that learning in a group does not only happen uh, on the member level that would be the kind of memory changes the things between our uh, changing between our ears when we learn something, uh, but learning in a group can also uh, happen uh, on the task level. So it, it's not something that's internal to any member, but uh, becoming better or changing the way work is distributed or a problem is uh, distributed. Uh, learning can happen on the tool level, becoming more uh, proficient uh, as a team to use uh, individual or, or collective tools uh, and services available. And uh, not only can it happen in these nodes, but also between uh, between the nodes. Uh, division of labor, division of job roles, and uh, division of roles. Um, it's a very rich notion of learning, and hence also of learning processes that that are suggested by uh, by, by, by this uh, terminology. Okay, so moving on, I guess I'm I I am um, in the paper. Uh, time is precious. I sort of I guess try to make the argument that a number of these forms of learning that are then typical for groups uh, are not easily um, not easily uh, fitted into the usual um, sort of way of, of, of thinking of change which which often means um, in many dominant methodological orientations at least in psychology and in education means uh, to think of change as changes in the val and values of variables um, in order to deal with the richness of group processes, uh, we probably have to look for, uh, for uh, maybe combining uh, multiple ways of, of thinking about uh, uh, change and, and, and processes. And um, um, uh, I uh, sort of, I guess, try to make sense of the literature as far as I un understood it and understand it. By sort of saying, okay, then we can have, in addition to variable-oriented analysis, we can have event-oriented uh, analysis. And uh, another important dimension is the granularity of the process we are we are looking at, or the kind of uh, um, uh, the kind of uh, detail we are considering, uh, reaching from atomistic, uh, where we think of processes happening something uh, step by step on a very small scale. Uh, to uh, holistic uh, views of, of, of change and process where, um, where um, uh, it in a sense matters that the, um, <coughs> that the people involved in, like in a group also have a sense of what the overall process itself should look like. And for instance, uh, you know, groups uh, and group crews and teams will come up with different narratives how their learning went because they have an idea of you know, ideal learning in a, in a, in a cockpit uh, is probably different than learning in a team that has to develop a, uh, a new product over weeks in a, in a company. Uh, and I guess I'm sort of in particularly sort of suggesting that this middle range here, uh, middle range is sort of interesting for, for a number of group processes where we move a, a little bit away from a very atomistic view uh, of process um, and uh, 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 and are still somewhat before uh, where basically only language-based uh, methods uh, uh, come to hand to, to understand uh, and represent process. And within that level where we have sort of, I speak of sequences, uh, there are <coughs> uh, also interesting ways uh, to, um, to um, 
uh, think about and analyze process in an, in in an event-based uh, 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 way. Or just well, si simply the, uh, if, if you want to use the big word ontology, and I warn you, I will use that word repeatedly <laughs> towards the end. And um, so I use it in the in the more philosophical sense, not in the sense of uh, of semantic web ontologies or so, but in the in the sense of uh, ontology, epistemology, epistemology so understandings of what the world is made out of that we want to analyze. Uh, that's ontology and uh, understandings of how we can gain knowledge about the world that we assume has a certain structure, which is epistemology. I'll, I'll use these words, even so they are agree quite, quite a bit, also today. Um, and very roughly, to get that across or in remind you, that in a variable-based ontology, uh, we sort of think of change as a change in a variable. It's typically quantitative, right? So it goes from, from small to big. Uh, changes tend to be continuous, like uh, liquid in a glass or pressure in a gas uh, that in, a, in a chamber, a gas chamber. Um, and uh, we think of factors then also uh, being continuous and affecting that variable. So a gas can be, uh, you know, the, the pressure can be increased by, by varying the heat uh, or by varying the, uh, the space uh, that, the, that the gas uh, can, can be uh, be exposed to or expand in. And the factors affecting the dependent variable, and they have this language of independent dependent variables, those are also usually, at least in principle, supposed to be continuous. So we can change heat continuously or temperature, and we can change uh, space continuously. Uh, and so if you look at this over time, then things would develop usually in this sort of plots, this, this time, and uh, then maybe you know, the, the value of the variable is plotted typically on the y-axis, and you get this sort of um, continuous change processes. Event ontology, or, or thinking of change in terms of events, uh, is, is sort of more like a, um, like a, a narrative, a history. Uh, there's an initial state, uh, the, um, the entity that we look at, maybe a group or an individual or a society or a nation, uh, is exposed to certain uh, events or undergoes certain changes. Uh, one event sort of triggers the next. Um, and um, uh, either by necessity or by logic ends in, a, in, a, in an end state, um, maybe because the analysis ends or, or the, uh, uh, the, the process ends, the underlying process ends. <coughs> and then the, the representation is not, the change representation typically is a sequence uh, of named um, uh, steps in the, in the event sequence. And we, we can combine the two, um, so one, one can, of course, look at how quasi-continuous changes affect an event uh, chain, and uh, that event chain also may have, um, may have uh, sort of quasi-quantitative effects, such as uh, the, the satisfaction of, the, of team members after a, after a number of uh, team activities, uh, we could maybe see that as an effect that we again measure with a variable. So they can also be mixed and matched. There's no um, strong dimension on, on that level. However, <coughs> the way change is conceptualized uh, is, uh, is, is really quite, uh, quite different. I don't think that any of that is, is, has been terribly new or, or is terribly new. Uh, my, my guess now is that the main reason why event-based um, sort of mechanisms or, or ways to describe change and process in general have not been so much uh, uh, have not made it as of yet into our normal methodological methodology uh, tools uh, pr presumably mainly has to do with sheer computational power so uh, you know when when quantitative quantitative statistics uh, was invented uh, early 19th century uh, analysis of variance and uh, correlation analysis, regression analysis, those things even uh, before the invention of computers you could do by hand. Uh, but uh, probabilistic methods, even though the mathematics was well known already, you, couldn't, you could not possibly do by hand. Right? Only with the rise of computers became it possible to do an uh, event, which is usually a stochastic analysis. And, um, and uh, it was, I think, in the end, as, as trivial as the lack of computational power some hundred years ago. <laughs> that led, led to uh, uh, social science, in particular areas like psychology, economics, 
educational research to a large extent, uh, becoming very much variable focused. Uh, I don't think there was a deeper rationale, or nobody really was aware of possible implications, um, and no no design behind that. I guess it was <laughs> it was pure lack of computation power. And to my knowledge, the mathematics was for this was around as well as for that, and it was just the numerical challenges that stopped us from seeing more of that early on. So let's look at this event stuff a little bit more. Um, also showing you an application. Um, uh, in, in research. So the typical way we sort of think about uh, or can represent uh, events uh, and processes described in event form is uh, the timeline, of course, uh, and then having uh, events sort of uh, anchored on the timeline. And um, uh, so we read this from the left to the right as time progresses. And uh, this is an example from Dan Southers' work. Some of you may know uh, Dan Southers' sort of uh, did very careful analysis of uh, uh, students working together in a sort of hypothesis testing uh, problem and uh, studying in particular how they, uh, uh, over time, how they start building on each other's contributions. So if it's a pair doing an inquiry, this sort of diagram sort of shows also where somebody at a later point in time, somebody went back referring to something observed before and all of that by, uh, by team members. It's here a pair. Um, individual one, individual two, and how they learned about this. Now, this is a very natural way of thinking about time, right? It runs from left to right, usually, and <laughs> of course it doesn't, but uh, uh, when, when represented in, in print and paper and uh, media, and uh, events sort of uh, can sort of be sorted by their uh, by the, by the time, uh, calendar time, uh, or, and, uh, and or logical time. The problem is, of course, and uh, you know, if you sort of look at Dan's work, uh, if you do this for, uh, you know, it's very natural for pairs. If you do it with more people and with multiple groups, it becomes very hard to analyze. One advantage is, of course, usually that we do this kind of process that we use our, can use our eyes to discern patterns or trends. Um, and that may be possible um, uh, for pairs, uh, so very small groups. Uh, some people argue that a pair is not a group. Uh, but it becomes uh, much more common. Uh, you know, uh, the visual and analytical machinery that we bring to this task really breaks down uh, if we have uh, more, than, more than two to three team members. Uh, and or if you have multiple groups and want to say something, how do they differ from each other or how are they similar? If you look at timelines, it becomes, of this granularity at least, it becomes very difficult. One thing I'm suggesting, uh, have been suggesting, is to uh, you know make use of, of methods very well developed in computer science, uh, uh, theoretical and practical computer science, uh, uh, to use uh, perhaps uh, representations that have been developed in computer science, in particular, uh, to uh, to represent process. Uh, the probably you know most best understood are patronets, uh, which there's an example here. Um, so here you don't see a timeline. Uh, <coughs> and you don't see individuals anymore. Um, a process model of this kind uh, sort of uh, uh, uses the states, so the, uh, the the space of events or steps people could be in, and then sort of maps out by using by using arrows uh, transitions from one state to the next. Um, uh, and I want to keep it as as as, as simple uh, as as that. Uh, so in order to find our timeline again here, we have to look at the model and at the kind of sequences it can generate or it can represent. Right. Uh, and so in a model, in a sense, it's like, it's like um, competence and performance and Chomsky's uh, famous distinction. A model of this type is more, it describes more competence. Uh, all the sequences uh, that model could, could go through given enough time. And the performance uh, is down here. All the, all the processes that this process or the system using this process did realize in, in the real world with limited physical uh, resources and limited uh, absolute time. Uh, and since I won't use Petri that's much uh, for he here, I, I won't explain them here. And probably some of you, either you understand them because you have, have a 
have that background or it takes too long anyway, but it's not so much in, uh, important for the argument. Important is that you know, these process models uh, develop in computer science uh, and related mathematics, uh, mathematical areas uh, are, um, are uh, not using a timeline, but they, they use a, 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 state, a state and transition logic uh, to, um, uh, to, to produce a very compressed, uh, yet very informative and complete a description of a process. But to find back our beloved uh, timeline, we need to look at the performance of the model and not just at the, um, at the uh, model itself. Um, yeah, well, one or two advantages of that is uh, it's, uh, this allows a holistic representation, so you can take these, these models often come from many individual events and sort of show uh, the commonalities among a great many uh, uh, group processes. And they allow parallelism. Often that is not so important, but sometimes it is important. Uh, so things happening in parallel, right? It's often not so important in small group work because we look at what people do together being co-located or being synchronously uh, put together. But as soon as you have groups that work in asynchronous media, parallelism becomes an issue, so people do different things while others do other things. And also if you look at collaborative learning uh, in classroom settings, like in, in co-located settings where uh, we use technology uh, but we also sit together, uh, teachers for instance often split the work and have, mud, have you know, give, give tasks that students do in parallel and then have to bring it together again. So whenever that occurs, uh, the timeline view is, is also a bit, a bit difficult to follow but uh, uh, these process models uh, ha are very nat have a very natural um, way to, or at least a, a formal and natural way to express parallelism. Okay, so where can we use this kind of models? Um, um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to sort of find now in this middle area of, of process potential process models where we we, are, we don't quite have a narrative, but we want to be more be, be a bit more holistic than just uh, long sequences of very individual, individual elements, uh, and the, the overall picture doesn't matter. So, in this middle ground, w w for which for which sort of group processes might might this be most useful? My suggestion is that these process models from computer science um, techniques from computer science are probably most uh, uh, profitable used in learning research and in group learning research um, for uh, studying group routines and practices and how they are enacted. Right? It's very difficult and often initial phases of group work are very chaotic, or so people say, um, and, um, and they follow very different paths. But once a group, like a learning team, uh, uh, settled, um, went through its storming phase and you know, sort of gets into its forming phase and norming phase, uh, once it's settled on certain decisions and settles, begins to settle on certain routines and practices, uh, that is then sort of the stage where uh, these process models might actually be quite interesting, uh, quite applicable or so, one, one would hope. Uh, because now uh, groups tend to do repeat things that worked for them before. Right? So groups are conservative in their practices, uh, maybe even more so than humans. In humans we talk about uh, uh, schema boundedness. So you know, once you solve the problem uh, one way, you try the next problem that looks similar. You try to use it with the same form, even though maybe actually different uh, to call for something different. Groups are even more so uh, conservative. Once they found a way of making a decision, they will try to repeat that way. Once they found a way to brainstorm, they will repeat it. Right? If they are not perturbed, they'll stick. They stick to the trajectory. Um, and so once groups are in that stage where some things become routine, not necessarily f for, the, for the good of the group, but because that's, I guess, our nature, um, then, then these process models type of logic might be, might be profitably used to describe uh, uh, group processes. And we use this, I want to show you one example, more of a research example, um, it's been published too, um, uh, uh, where, uh, <coughs> where we, where we uh, sort of uh, looked at decision-making practices. So we looked at, we gave groups uh, uh, tasks uh, which at some stages involved decision-making. So they had to decide between, they had to first of all just identify alternatives, um, 
identify what matters or how these alternatives should be compared on which dimensions, uh, place the alternatives on these dimensions, and then make a decision, hopefully somewhat consensual, if not rational, uh, as to the path of action based on that decision process. Um, and um, there's um, you know, literally thousands of studies on group decision making and organizational science and in, uh, social psychology. So in general, uh, there is some hope that one would find regularities and invariants there because uh, uh, there is no single way that has been identified for groups to make optimal decisions. Uh, but there's evidence that groups uh, settle on certain ways, certain decision routines, as I just mentioned, uh, uh, and, um, and those we might be able to identify with uh, uh, process mining. Well, in, in this instance, we looked at chat data, I guess something that also many of you will work with. It could also be done with, um, in similar ways with forum posting on forums uh, and, uh, and other of these uh, sort of... Uh, text-based um, <coughs> um, synchronous and asynchronous uh, communication media. So in, in this case, in this study that I want to describe a couple of points of, it was done in chat sessions, done, chat sessions done synchronously, uh, synchronous chat, uh, where groups discussed, uh, members of groups uh, were supposed to come to decision. Um, um, so we had a collaboration environment, uh, part of it was a chat environment, uh, the decision making was done in the chat environment largely. Uh, there were asynchronous work phases where they used other tools, but the decision making was done while they came online together for weekly meetings. Uh, those things were recorded. Um, uh, the, the chat was recorded, timestamped, a usual, very usual thing. And then we, we are used uh, process mining or m methods to get to models uh, to find invariants or patterns in in the decision-making behavior as reflected in this chat box. So that's um, you know, sort of practically how you go about sort of trying to uh, go about the, the business here of finding such process models from, from data. Um, we had to identify uh, phases in the chat when decision-making was the task. Uh, then code the steps in that 10 to 15 minute typically uh, period in terms of decision making steps. I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, and then um, um, identify as it invariants or patterns in, in, the, uh, uh, in the sequence of uh, decision making steps and try to visualize those. Uh, and if you look at one group, for instance, a so rather typical group of five students or so, I think. Uh, over a couple of weeks, they, they engage in 23 decision-making uh, episodes. So uh, these are now 10 to 15 minute, typically, or half hour uh, phases where the chat was around decision-making. And coding everything, uh, everything decision-related in those 23 uh, instances of the decision process uh, for this group led to 1,115 events or steps, which I don't show you on a timeline because it would be a long time. <laughs> I have to click here. The decision coding we use is, uh, is um, we didn't invent the wheel, we used uh, a very often used, very you know, well understood uh, uh, taxonomy for a decision making steps uh, uh, de developed by Poole, Poole and Holmes um, some years ago and, and very often used in decision making research, small group decision making research, um, online or face to face, mostly face to face groups, and, that, and for face to face groups, and that distinguishes between problem definition, orientation, which means identifying relevant uh, dimensions to compare the uh, alternatives against, um, and then a uh, various uh, sub-steps of a so developing a, a solution that is coming to a decision um, and ending with an agreement or, or non-agreement. Uh, the um, So we have about uh, 10 uh, event types uh, based on this uh, taxonomy. Then humans, a uh, PhD student or two, went over, <laughs> as part of their research, went over these uh, uh, chat entries uh, that are around decisions and coded uh, the utterances of the students in terms of this uh, coding scheme uh, with with a with a satisfying that can be done with satisfying reliability. 
And so what do you get out of this? It's a typical code account exercise initially. So you get for each of these uh, 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 decision-making events, uh, types of events, you get your frequency and, uh, uh, and you can or cannot draw conclusions about this. Now typically decision-making research would you know, sort of look at these numbers and maybe the groups would work under two conditions, one with a group decision support system, one without. And you would hope, let's say, that something good would happen when you support the decision-making process and you would look at the frequencies to find out if, if the technology support the decision uh, technology would have made a difference. Or uh, whatever, you could increase emotional the group dynamics in one group and have hypothesis how that would affect the frequencies and, and, and so forth and do sort of this kind of control group logic uh, design. Uh, that's not what we did here, uh, but we look at, so wanted to look at time uh, patterns. And uh, uh, using our uh, a concrete method, we used, uh, in general, for this kind of work, use uh, PROM, which is a uh, library, a, fr a framework plus library of process mining algorithms, a, a great many of them, uh, available for free. Uh, <coughs> and uh, maintained by, uh, by the community, particularly business computing on, of uh, process modelers and process miners. Um, and from that library, we used one uh, method uh, after trying out some others. Uh, we used the heuristic miner in this work uh, to, uh, to um, uh, identify uh, patterns in, in the uh, over time. Um, and the heuristic miner uses a heuristic which uh, you know, basically says, you know, I have the belief that A is followed by B is calculated by you know, subtracting all the instances in where A uh, followed B from where B followed A, so where the uh, sequence is uh, turned about, divided by the sum of the two plus one. Uh, and that basically sort of gives you a, 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 a value that varies between uh, minus one and plus one, um, meaning with plus one that there's a strong belief, so to speak, uh, strong evidence that A and B indeed follows A or A precedes B. Um, nice feature of this heuristic is that it, uh, in, uh, that it becomes uh, sort of, um, uh, the, the value also increases with the number of cases. Um, well, you can think that's a nice feature, it can also be problematic, obviously, but in general, in statistics is considered to be a nice feature to have. And basically that's then used by a ma machine algorithm to sort of sort out and come up with a sort of most likely uh, sequences, which then take uh, this form, um, sort of transition diagram. So using this, <coughs> this uh, method, you sort of identify, you can then set, set thresholds. Uh, you can say, you know, show me only uh, those relations where the belief of the system in the in the strength of the relation in the in the step step dependence is over a certain value, and you can tune that. Uh, lots of things can be tuned in process mining, which is a problem. We can come back to that um, because without theory, we don't really know how to do the tuning. Well, anyway, if you use sort of default values uh, for the heuristic miner, as suggested by those that develop the algorithm. Um, you know, group A might look like this. Uh, so it starts from a problem definition, and then with a certain likelihood, which is pretty high, it goes into a, uh, into an orientation phase uh, first and oscillates between those two. Uh, with a less likelihood, it would go from problem definition to suggesting solution alternatives right away, and then going right away to coming to a solution confirmation. That's sort of a shortcut here. Um, and uh, it's less likely for this group than going through a more elaborate process of, uh, of uh, things. Since you in the back don't see all the details, here, <laughs> a bit higher here. So basically the numbers mean, and this is not so relevant for the argument, but just to give an idea what you get out of this analysis, uh, this is the belief strength, this is the heuristic value, right? It's, you can sort of interpret it somewhat, you know, not really as the likelihood of going from here to here, it's, directed, it's a directed graph, um, transition graph. Uh, this value, you, it's sort of the, the frequency, average frequency of, uh, of uh, going from problem definition to a solution alternative. This is the number of cases uh, that have been 
of, the, of this episode that have been observed. And this is a number, absolute number of cases where this uh, transition was actually made. So these are absolute numbers, and this is then the value in terms of this dependency measure uh, that varies between minus one and one. Uh, so that's, in a sense, fairly straightforward to interpret. It becomes more interesting to do it comparatively, right? So this is group A, this is another group B. And again, you know, sort of with your eye, relying on your eyes, and uh, data mining and process mining is a lot also about using, using our eyes to make inferences, right, inferences. In modern, much of modern science uh, uses visualization methods to that purpose. And you, here, obviously, what's sort of, what's sort of evident to our eyes, at least, uh, minus with user, this is a bit thicker, this is a bit leaner. Uh, and there, you know, if you look at, you of course, have to look at the details, but, you know, this has semantics. So, uh, in a sense, this group is uh, following the normative process more regularly, more often, more frequently than this group, which has more variation from, from a fully rational decision-making process. It's because they go also take shortcuts. They don't bother much identifying alternatives. They go right to picking one and saying we are done. Of course, that could often happen, I guess, in real groups too. Um, so here, uh, even so, these are these are data from thousands and more events, right? Like this is 1,115 events. You see that it can be compressed uh, to a level where we can now use again our visual uh, inferencing engine, which we come sort of given genetically. <coughs> of course, you can also calculate values over this. You can like calculate, you know, using social network type of parameters, graph theoretical parameters, you can calculate centrality measures or whatever to get a get a number for this spread that you see physically. But it will just confirm that or, or make it more mysterious. I don't know. So you can get numbers based on this, but uh, uh, I won't talk about this now. It's not. Okay, so that um, you know you can so some publication what we made out of this semantically. That's not so much the point here. Uh, the point is that provided that this is somewhat interpretable, uh, this uh, obviously would help the researchers if I was one to sort of see yeah these two groups might be different and thinking about why and going back to maybe details in the log files to understand that. But also it could be used as feedback to the group itself, right? So you, you know, can say, okay, this group looks like that, and you, you look like this. You know, what do you make out of this? Good, bad? Why, why do you think you're different? What did they do different from what you did? And we use it actually this way. We start sort of using these things, feeding back to groups uh, for, um, for uh, getting their, um, uh, their reflection going. Because remember, this learning process is, is about reflection on, on um, time's running out here too so um, um, I personally don't think that this example is the best use of process mining I think a better way of using it if you use it is doing it hypothesis driven because in the end this is induction right yeah. so process mining in an, in an untheoretic sense just looking for patterns is as, as theoretic as any other inductive method as any other data mining method or correlational method that you can think of, um, um, but one can also use, good news is one can also use process mining in a hypothesis oriented way, so you can, you can think of a model, hopefully a process model, hopefully theory based, and then test it against data you have, right? that's of course much better scientific practice. Um, so for instance, quite practically, you can use something like WAP WAPET, which is a PetriNet editor to construct a PetriNet, and then use PROM, prom and its uh, conformance checking uh, machinery to tell you how good your model fits the data. All right. And to the extent that your model up here comes from theory, so you have an idea why you think it should be that way, <laughs> then it's, it's better scientific practice. WAPET is also open source, quite powerful, you know, if you ever want to create a PetriNet. <laughs> Uh, um, and it, 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 it saves uh, Petronet in a way that Prompt can import. So uh, yeah, it's done very, very quickly. Um, it, well, it is pretty well maintained. Uh, and you know what you get then, for instance, you can make, create a model of, uh, of uh, a process. So that's the hypothesis, the theory, the normative one. And then uh, Prompt, for instance, will give you sort of an overlay. It will show you graphically 
and I won't get the details so you can use color coding where the uh, actual process differed from the proposed process. Plus it shows you performance data, how many tokens were pushed to the Petrinet, never mind, that gets too technical. Uh, this is, by the way, taken straight out of uh, the, uh, uh, the chapter Process Mining from Education Data and the Handbook of Education Data Mining, which actually uses learned data from e-learning. So students walking through university courses, and this is the running example. I find it an odd example, but then you might not. <laughs> um, more interesting, I think, because, uh, yeah, Petrinets never fit real data, as we know. So... <laughs> uh, I tried. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, another another way to do a conformance based uh, to do model driven analysis, hypothesis driven analysis, is not to sort of speculate about a whole process that you that you want to test against data, but your theory may be only leading constraints, right? So you can come up with certain uh, propositions, statements which uh, the group process should obey, and not and not. Uh, and, you know, you, and you, you don't want to find instances where the, where the constraints are, are are not met. So it's it's constraints based logic, right? It's much more realistic to do with, uh, let's say, with uh, unstructured group work, because in a sense you don't have an idea how the group will go about its task by and large. But certain things should not happen, like there should never be a group work where uh, a member did not at least contribute once. You, know, you could say, you know, if I'm, yeah, you could check, you can check. So this constraint-based checking logic is, uh, is uh, also quite elegant and, again, PROM supports it to a surprising level of, uh, of you know, usability. Uh, uh, so you can, <laughs> to the extent that you uh, get your head around how to formulate these constraints. They are, they are described in a logic, in a time-based logic called RTL. Um, uh, but to those of you who are, you know, Computer scientists, that's probably fairly straightforward. To those of you that do Perl programming, it might look pretty uh, straightforward. And to those of you who did Prolog ever in their life, it probably will look absolutely clear. Because, of course, we identify patterns, uh, constraints as patterns, and then we match these constraints against the data. And as I said, we would hope to find, uh, we would hope to find, uh, if our model is good, our constraints are good, uh, that means the model is good, that means we find few instances where the constraints are not met. And again, PROM, this, this pro library of for process mining will show you um, quite user-friendly um, what were, were there instances where the constraints were not met. And that can be interpreted uh, as um, in the usual sense, right? So that means the model has been, is not supported by the data. Uh, and as a researcher, we can now look into this if that's, if that's a problem or, you know, can be fixed or not if you want to fix it. So let me summarize uh, benefits so, uh, uh, of this process modeling approach. It model aggregates the group process, aggregates event data on a group level, uh, so we don't have individual timelines to deal with. Uh, the analysis, if you use this, can be quite reliable. Uh, as I said, you have to do too many parameters potentially, but uh, then the results will be the same, given the same data. There's a, a, a certain amount of reduction of manual labor. Um, pedagogically, um, um, we are almost ready to say a bit more than in terms of writing now how, how one can use this for mirroring feedback with what effects. Uh, the story there is a bit sad to, to say tell that uh, students don't like this transition diagram. Students like timelines. So if you show them transition diagrams, they sort of need a long time to interpret that. But we try to work around that. Um, and also something I don't have time to mention, but uh, definitely needs mentioning in a research context. You know, you may some of you may wonder, you know, how do I do a testing, statistical testing on this? So how how do I find out how good a model is in statistical terms? Well, of course there are methods to do that, and they follow the usual model testing logic, so chi square, of course, and uh, uh, sort of variance, and so you get expected frequencies, you get model based frequencies, and you can compare the two statistically uh, if the difference is statistically significant, something you usually don't want to have uh, by square or more advanced um, statistical methods such as log it analysis. I don't want to go that way. I want to sort of end uh, my presentation with a bit of a skepticism uh, or skeptical word. Uh, one thing you, you won't find me, don't see me much doing, for instance, me is now uh, being, being busy applying this method to yet another data set and yet another data set. 
And so uh, also I'm often asked to sort of you know, work with colleagues. They have a data set on collaborative learning or self-guided learning. It uh, doesn't really matter anymore. They have log files and they, they read the papers, for instance mine, and they say, well, oh, that's a great method, let's do it. And <laughs> I'm increasingly having scruples to do it, here's why. <laughs> Um, and to some of you, this may be old, old, old news again. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, uh, there are a couple of, uh, there are a number of problems with uh, uh, process <coughs> mining and data mining, I guess, in general, in education. I think. Uh, so I, I guess my, my statement would be that uh, this this way of uh, analyzing uh, process data. And thinking about the underlying processes is, is appropriate mainly for d design processes. So where we want to find out if something that we have, let's say, pedagogically designed as a good script is actually enacted by students, right? So it's sort of monitoring uh, task. That's not unimportant, in particular for e-learning. You, you know, sometimes you may want to make sure that the pedagogy is followed. And if not, then it should be for good reason. But I think uh, it's not a good method for um, uh, it's not a good method for um, uh, developing substantive theory of groups. By that I mean finding empirically new things, uh, and it's not a good uh, framework for normative decisions, which is, I guess, a fairly strong claim given that increasingly normative decisions are based on these sort of exercises. Where we look at successful groups, for instance, we look at less successful. We look at do their process does their process differ, and then we say, oh yeah, the process of the successful groups that's the one we should teach to the next cohort, right, or such. I don't think that this approach has uh, a, a scientific basis. The reasons are uh, are multiple ones, and I really can just scratch on the surface here. I hope to eventually put this into something of writing, but then I hesitate because it has been written so often about <laughs> so, you know, just repeat it here for the purpose of process mining community of, um, uh, of course one, one thing is that process models don't, don't, just, don't, don't capture intentionality and reflexivity uh, which is of course immediately a problem since we deal with humans process mining has often been it's often applied to um, uh, in human context but to very regular and top down design processes not to describe substantive <coughs> And uh, perhaps more, even more, term, or, you know, I don't know, there are also serious problems with taking events as foundational. Uh, events are not foundational, neither ontologically as a, world of how, as a view of how the world is put together, nor epistemologically as, as a way to learning about how the world, uh, or describing knowledge, creating knowledge about how the world is, is put together. Um, let me start with a simpler point, because that's, I don't think there's any, any basis in sort of uh, pretending to assuming that a group would be driven by a model um, in, a, in any strong sense, right? Humans are reflective and intentional beings. That is, uh, human relationships, you know, depend on ideas about th that the participants have about these relationships. We, we construct them and we maintain them at the same time, which also means we can change them all the time, right? If any of you now pretend this was not a conference, but a party, you're free to do that, <laughs> and and, um, and some of you probably would like uh, to do that. The, um, um, so that means, uh, of course, very simply that, in simplest terms, that um, uh, we have to think of process as a as a resource to groups and to individuals uh, 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 alike. Uh, if, um, if if we suggest, for instance, a way of making a decision or leading a discussion or coming to a organizing a, a group uh, process or a team meeting, uh, this will always depend on uh, the, the team members interpreting uh, that model as proposed to them, um, uh, making decisions if they accept or reject that model of going about their work and, uh, and or modifying it, which parts accept and reject. And the enactment of the process, even if they decide uh, together or individually to follow the, the lead, uh, the proposed way of doing it, even when doing that, there will be m many small deviations and changes uh, and appropriations. So it, it is just inevitable, inevitable that we see this as a as a process of um, of um, uh, of interpretation. 
And in this process mining language, there's nothing that supports interpretation or, 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 or any of, of that kind. Uh, so the moment a group starts to discuss uh, or reflect on what is it we are doing, is it kind of the thing we want to do? Do we want to come to that, to that end? Do we want to follow this process? You have group processes which are themselves no longer modeled in the, in the process modeling language, right? It's, you would need a meta, le a meta level to talk about that. And uh, that's possible and quite, quite interesting perhaps to think about meta architecture. So another process on top of this that describes the process of reasoning about this process. But you need that multiple, and it, for you in principle it doesn't end. So, uh, we, we know that, that that's one, one problem and uh, one challenge. So as soon as, as soon as you have questions that in a sense assume that your team members are, uh, are uh, reflective, engaging in reflection, about what it is they do, it's probably that you can't ever cover that with a process model. And the other thing, and I, it's only short here, but then um, uh, maybe I'll just do it with one slide and, and leave the, if you're curious, you can contact me. Uh, I think events are also not, uh, not I think, important, uh, important, uh, developments in the philosophy of science uh, over the last 20 years or so basically have have led to a, a consensus now at least in the real in the in the in the hard sciences that events are not ontologically foundational um, and this is a very famous uh, here system by a, a philosopher called Roy Basker some of you may know his work um, uh, he's sort of the inventor of critical realism or scientific realism as it's now called um, um, uh, and he basically suggested that you know, in order to understand science and, and the world, uh, events are not are not the foundational level. The foundational level is, is structures. So he distinguishes between things that we can experience, the world of the empirical, between things that are actual, so things that have happened, uh, but some of them we may not be able to observe or experience, but they still happen. Right, the, the tree in the wall and the forest that falls, and nobody's there to observe it. It's still an event, but it's a non-event because it's not observed. Um, and, but then there are also things that are neither actual, then they're not necessarily happening, nor are they empirical. It's a different question if they can be observed. But there may also be uh, things uh, that are processes that we cannot, uh, that not necessarily become actualized. Nevertheless, they are real. Uh, so these are uh, sort of the, 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 the structures and the processes that, that, that make events happen. Um, and so basically, Pascal suggests that there are really two uh, distinctions. Experience are not equal to events. I mean, that's, I guess, pretty clear. But events are also not a model of reality, right? They are underlying. Uh, the world is, is, uh, is of, a, of a kind that some things that can happen uh, in principle will never happen because they are blocking each other. Um, so think about uh, modern physics, right? I think currently we spend billions on, it, on observing something that we think is real, which is that I think photons uh, do a certain thing or that black matter exists, but we, we have a hard time making it actual. Why? Because it was very small particles, the way we think our observational technologies interfere with the phenomenon, uh, or the phenomenon is so rare because things interfere in the bigger picture uh, of the world that you know they happen once every two billion years, and that will be very hard for us to verify at any point in time. Um, this is sort of dramatic, uh, dramatic sort of uh, uh, consequences, uh, which are uh, 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 which are hard to sort of uh, you know sort of put on a couple of slides. But it, it ba basically let me and you know should lead others to. Um, sort of question if, uh, if we can really be satisfied with an event description logic. I guess we need to dig deeper following the model in, 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 in other science, in particular physics. Uh, but th there's been also increasingly work on how the social sciences sort of can uh, take on this sort of uh, 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 you know, this distinction between real, actual, and, uh, and, and empirical. Uh, just one or two con consequences before I end. Uh, and a, a strong complications for causality. Uh, 
in particular than the regularity conception of, 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 of causality. And that's very much also in the event logic, right? That basically causal relations are only those things that are regular contingent, contingent relations, things that follow each other in a predictable manner. This, this is all we can know about causality. It nicely map, maps also into modus ponens um, um, uh, and then covering laws. Uh, this is completely tied to an event logic. If you, if you, if you, um, if you believe and have to believe, or be, if you become convinced that events are not the foundation layer of reality, then the epistemic side of things that causality can be described in forms of regular regularities in the empirical or actual world uh, gets gets seriously um, uh, uh, shaken. I want to make this a bit more constructive uh, before I really end. Uh, so, uh, what's a better way to think about to thinking about reality and and causality in research? Well, we should not be happy with identifying regularities between B follows A or A precedes B, um, and then sort of seeing how, in how many cases that happens and if we can generalize from that to a to a larger picture. What happens in in many other sciences uh, is that we sort of should take this observation perhaps that a regular follow, a B regular follows A only if, uh, of, an, of an indication that we have to understand and come up with models why this happens. So in a sense we have to forget about A and ask what can, what can bring about B. Uh, and uh, that means uh, to, um, uh, to think of models, metaphors, mechanisms, whatever M, your, M word you want to use, of something substantive, of a substantive theory, what can it bring about B? Not just a regularity theory, but a substantive one. So which mechanism, or which, uh, not sequence of events, but uh, you know, model, metaphor, mechanism, uh, something you know, sort of intuitively causal, and it can be more formal, but I don't have time to, to find that. To the extent that you can think of something that can bring about B, you go back to your data, or you look for new data to see if M, if your model actually works, if it's if you find evidence for it. That's exactly how physics works mostly, right? In physics, people stipulate something like there is black matter, and then they try to find it. They don't look for events and do a control group experiments with and without black matter because that that's that's not even possible. Uh, so there's definitely, uh, of course, always relation to data, but in a different sense than the usual uh, covering method. And uh, uh, so then, you know, quite clearly, laws are not statements about events or experiences, but statements about the ways of acting, the acting of causal entities. That's what your M should give you. M is unconditional. It doesn't, you know, it should hold under all circumstances, but it doesn't hold under in all circumstances because it's, uh, it's blocked by other, by other causal processes. And it also implies an asymmetry between prediction and explanation. Uh, uh, predictions are not explanations, while in the, uh, in the, in the covering law world they are. Uh, in particular, there can be explanations without predictions, like in history. It's a perfectly fine uh, science in, in this sense. Um, uh, also, of course, quite different from the natural sciences in many respects, but it's not a science that can make prediction. Yes, we can make predictions. And what does that mean for data mining? I think... Um, uh, and education process mining, I think these methods are useful to identify uh, areas where there might be substantive things at work because they should bottom up in regularities, of course. At least, well, with some probability they will. Uh, but they cannot provide themselves explanation for these, uh, for these phenomena. So we need to dig deeper. We need to, um, we need to um, develop substantive theory instead of only um, regularity. Uh, theory and I have to jump over this. This is kind of what I try to develop in terms of substantive theory. I want to want to end here. So I started, I guess, with a with a bit of sort of an alternative to variable based methods, and I think these event based methods and, and logic has has quite some potential. I showed you an application for that, um, but I also think that there are limits uh, to this um, methodology as a way to develop substantive theory. And we need to deal with that. Thank you.